so to begin, our next interlude is Roger Bonera Gar, and he is a native of Trinidad and Tobago. He is the author of Tarnish and Masquerade, Gully, Bury My Clothes, which was long listed for the National Book Award and won the Society of Midland Authors Award for Poetry, where Brooklyn at. A Cave Canem Fellow, he is a two-time winner of the National Poetry Slam and has appeared on numerous occasions on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. Roger is writer in residence at Brooklyn's National Sawdust, co-founder of New York City's Louder Arts Project, and frontman of the band Miyamoto is Black Enough, founding member of New York City's Vision Intro into Art and creator and facilitator of the Baldwin Protocols reading series. He is program director with Free Write, Free Write Artists and Literacy at Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. Please welcome Roger Monaragard. What to do, Boston? Uh, in, I wrote some notes in thinking about, you know, why I'm here and how I was asked to come here. And, and I want to start by uh, acknowledging that I was uh, kind of recruited to come and be a part of this conference by Eric Williams of the Silver Room in Chicago. If you give him a round of applause. Uh, so thanks to Eric for inviting me here and all the organizers who put this together or have been responsible in any way for my being here. I'm very, very, very excited, way more excited than when I was told I was coming to something called Black in Design. Um, I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm, I'm thinking of my daughters and uh, this, is, this has been a fantastic event so far. Uh, Eric's store, is not just a place of retail, right? But he has built of it a cultural hub for black people in the physical premises of the store and in the surrounding neighborhood. The Silver Room's annual block party is, I believe not an exaggeration to say, a Chicago treasure. I, however, I moved to New York City in 1987 from Trinidad and Tobago. Howard Griffith had recently been murdered chased from a white neighborhood by a group of European Americans and onto the parkway. The following year, Yusuf Hawkins was murdered by another group in the same neighborhood for the crime of having come there to visit a girl. Those of us in this room can probably recite from rote any number of these stories. I live in Chicago now and I work with criminalized youth and there is many a story of young people of color being arrested off the street simply for being downtown. It's hard to think about black in design or black design without considering this country's history of housing and space violence against communities of color. And to be at the preeminent institution of higher learning in the country talking about and celebrating black design is to acknowledge that we're occupying a metaphor for being black in the United States of America and in fact, all of the Western world. From segregation to imprisonment to white riots against black ownership to the historic and ongoing crisis of policing and criminalization within communities of color, the task for blackness has been how to create spaces, both literal and figurative, where not only survival is possible, but thriving is expected, and in some cases, unreasonably demanded. In the session just before lunch, I came in during the Q&A, someone mentioned the history and significance of the porch to black life in America, for instance. From these spaces, Black America has forefronted or dominated a majority of American cultural production from music to fashion to film to science to sport. So this gathering and amalgamation of ideologies, ideas, resources is important to the continued thrive of black folk in America. 
As a writer, it means design of form and content, often outside the boundaries of what we are told is acceptable or relevant. In this way, I see black design and black survival as a history and future of imaginative triumph in all fields of endeavor, including the economic and scientific. It's from this stance of defense and attack that my most recent book of poems, Where Brooklyn At, attempted to say some things about the violence and tragedy of gentrification and the triumph of displaced communities, even inside those spaces from which we are displaced. It is from this vantage point that I will read poems today, both from that book and maybe from the in-progress book, American Oshun, which I think, because I'm still working on it, it is also about how the black imagination has designed spaces, in this case, spiritual spaces, within which to thrive. So thanks for having me. I'll read a couple of poems. I'll be around the conference for the rest of the day. Please feel free to come holler if you have questions, concern, or general beef. Like I said, I was thinking about my daughter, so I'll go with this piece first. Nina. The bike shop used to be a bodega. The liquor store used to be a pizza parlor. This cafe used to be an Italian restaurant. That kiosk used to be Joe, an old man on a little stool. The yoga studio used to be a butcher's. The bar with jars of M&Ms on the counter used to be a candy store. The park used to be a park with crack vials and potholes on the running track and dirt in the center of the field where grass should be. And that dog run was a field of geraniums. The Dominican restaurant used to be cheap, used to have a line out the door. I used to be able to afford to live above it and come down in the middle of the night and get half a chicken and a Heineken, especially after my girl left and I was tired staring at the linoleum and the sloping floors. The organic market used to be a sneaker store. Kim's Grocery used to sell 40s. The subway stop used to be dangerous. Used to be able to buy crack right here. This coffee shop used to be a law office run by Mr. Jenkins, who chain smoked Newports, whose family came from North Carolina in 1950. That sushi bar used to be the Jamaican spot. They sold patties, hard dough bread, and the best sea moss. Those condos used to be a three-family house. I loved a woman who lived there. She cooked steaming pots of rice and fish broth and cuckoo and dumplings and stocked the fridge with Guinness when I came calling. <laughs> The bank used to be a quinceanera shop. The barber shop used to be a papa's house and was once overrun by rats. We filled in the spaces between the steps leading down to what used to be the storage room but was your papa's floor. We clubbed the rats when we saw them. They screamed like children. The library used to be the library but no one from the projects around the corner goes there anymore. Saturdays used to be the Central American League where they wouldn't pass the ball to your papa or your uncle Cyril. The pool used to be empty. The tie joint used to be the OTB, and every morning Joe, the old man on the stool, walked there slowly, leaning on his cane, spent 50 cents for coffee in those blue and white coffee cups, and placed two $2 bets, and went back to his stool and called out to me, hey, young fella, and told me how it used to be. Coffee used to be 50 cents, Nina. Beat cops used to be in squad cars. They weren't always so polite. Biggie used to freestyle right over there on that corner, and Jay-Z came up right over here by Marcy, and Big Daddy Kane once played a block party here on Marcus Garvey, and your father used to be slim and ran these courts on Macon and Malcolm X. The new Casablanca bar and lounge used to be for all black people. All black people used to be able to afford this corner. This garden used to be a drum circle before the new neighbors called the cops to complain. Stuyvesant Heights used to be bed that family with a stroller used to be black. Those young people on the stoop over there used to be black and Puerto Rican and arrested. <laughs> that school used to be public. This used to be Brooklyn. They used to be scared to come here. They used to be scared to come here. They used to be sorry for us that we had to live here. It was a look like pity, like scorn. It looked like this corner and these bricks and this too. Brooklyn was what they left when they ran. Brooklyn was what they left when they ran. Brooklyn used to be black, Nina. I swear to you, this used to be Brooklyn. <laughs> I 
because we got to be fresh with the design in all spaces, we. We rough with it. We grip each other for purchase and dear life. We discover angles into each other's most vulnerable confessions. We make love. We sit back at the bar and let the pitch and thunder of the pool table soundtrack our hearts. We laugh. We slap box. We rough tickle. We ask hard questions about each other's other lovers. We so fly. We cook. We love ginger and habaneros. We love cilantro and the musk we make when we cook. That is a metaphor. We while out, we scared as hell, we not scared to say that, we never ending, we cocky like that, we parents, unorthodox, radical, we building, we love, we making church, we religious with our bodies, rough with the truth we expect, we gospel into orgasm, we nasty in that good good, we make lust, we make sweat, we make our bellies thunder in the right places, we drink whiskey, rum, gin, we wear bright colors, we gods, mostly we God, he lets us call Call us that we sanctify it. Where Brooklyn at? <laughs> Yo, you could say that shit in Alaska and get that response. Yeah. That's for real. It's so real. Nana has a gold Glock pendant, guns tattooed on her forearms, a voice like gravel made of stones worn smooth by the sea. She pours drinks deep in the long narrow bar on Grand where I go three, maybe four nights a week and many mornings. Nana will let me nurse a single vodka and write for three hours. Mostly, she'll top me up with Kettle One and tell me stories. Around us, row homes get sold and lifelong businesses get bought out. Nena says, fuck, <laughs> under her breath a lot at new faces in the neighborhood. <laughs> but she crisps behind the bar. Nena calls me sweetie. I'm in love with women who tend bars anyway. We go out one time. <laughs> All right, two, two more and then call it a day. In which, when I was writing this book, I'd have these crazy dreams about gentrification and about the meld that happens, right? And they, also inv they always involve rappers. So this is the dream in which Method Man and I run from the police. <laughs> For real, like I, just, like, I just got up and wrote the dream down and was like, bam. dream, me and Method Man are hanging out and it's late and it's Brooklyn, the old one, with bodegas that only serve through a turnstile in bulletproof glass after 10 p.m. <laughs> and Method Man steals something, something small, inconsequential. Maybe it's from a bodega or maybe it's from a high-end supermarket, but all of a sudden it's the new Brooklyn now, so Method breaks into a wild run because we see the police. I break out into a wild run behind him, like in the opening scene of Casino Royale. We running like a crazy white man is chasing us. And we get home to Method's house, a project building in Brownsville over, over on Mother Gaston and Broadway. I recognize it because I used to date a woman who lived there and I learned to load a gun and extend a clip in that apartment and wouldn't you know it, Method and his mom live in the very same apartment, top floor of the building. From the bedroom window, you can look down on the elevated J train as it leaves Chauncey Avenue. We go to bed because we've got past the police. I still don't know what Method Man lifted, and I don't know if this is old Brooklyn or new, but the apartment is clean and there are no roaches and we fall asleep. 
But we awake to a police siren and the entire apartment bathed in blue flashing light from outside, which is weird because we are on the 14th floor. <laughs> and the doorbell rings. Method's mom still sleep though, but he breaks into a wild run out the house and down the back stairs like Ong back in Thai Warrior. And I run after him and somewhere around the seventh floor, he ducks into a door and comes back out in a full Michael Jackson costume. <laughs> Like in Smooth Criminal, the white hat and everything. And he jumps over the railing and lands on the basement floor. And I don't know if I jump over the railing or just run down the stairs. But me and Method just walk out the back door disguised like Michael and turn left away from sirens. I don't recognize the streets though. I can't tell if I'm in the old Brooklyn or the new. We don't think about it. We break into a wild run. Uh, thank you so much. You've been really uh, attentive and wonderful audience and uh, word. <laughs> Our bodies are made of stars. The uh, Epigraph. Uh, so I, I, I used to be part of this uh, art series in Chicago. And uh, so every now and then they'd call and commission a piece from me to be performed. And um, after a while, it became this kind of joke about what kind of topic could they give me that I wouldn't turn into some shit about being black. <laughs> And these motherfuckers steady tried, too. <laughs> so, uh, so they asked me to write about molecular clouds. <laughs> Check the shit out. <laughs> Epigraph is from Wikipedia. A molecular cloud, sometimes called a stellar nursery, if star formation is occurring within, is a type of interstellar cloud whose density and size permits the formation of molecules. Wikipedia. I'm going back to Brooklyn. <laughs> the stacks and stacks of houses stacked on houses. The police cameras mounted on tree houses mid-hood. The youth's heads all davening to one massive downbeat, deconstructing in their bodies every molecule of sound so that they make of those bodies a reimagined God when they burst anew with restrung energy. I'm going back to Lavantil. The shacks stacked precarious on a North Trinidad hillside where you can hear at every moment culture being born and born again in steel. In the rumble deep inside an old oil drum, a new chrome making sound of redesigned anger. You hear the boom of automatic gunfire, the slide of chamber, the unmistakable smell of sooted steel too. That is sometimes how we burst, kept tight under the pressure of some interstellar force swirling around us and then we are. Astronomers today believe that a large fraction of the atoms inside our bodies were once stars that became supernovae that were then launched into the universe when these stars exploded. They're half right but they don't know how we turn right back around and make the universe when we explode, when we emerge from cloud and doubt, new and fiery with outrage, with languages these larger bodies cannot decipher. In La Horqueta, Trinidad, a housing project, we call them schemes in Trinidad, moved people from enclaves with names like John John and Never Dirty, starts at the main highway and moves a section by section called Phases, deep towards Bush, in places named Talparo and Brazil, the sort of villages named by people the city councils couldn't bother to grace with running water or electricity. In phase six, down where we were afraid to venture, even in 1987, when we were young and unafraid. 
We once saw a man with no teeth, blunted higher than an interstellar medium, do things with a ball barefoot in a La Hoqueta League football game, games which often ended in gunfight, which moved us to proclaim him the greatest footballer we had ever seen. <laughs> This league, which national players sought when they wanted to be anointed as real, as stars among stars forming and burning out right here in phase six La Hoqueta, a man barefoot gave no thought to the cleats of his opponents and scored at will. The poet has been saying for years, warning really, that we got niggers with wings and stars for limbs in the most unlikely places we were making the world. Wouldn't you like to be in it and made of star matter, of new and shooting brilliant gas made of us? The poet has a poem to write. He's obsessed with what words put under pressure might yield. He is lucky in this pursuit of meta meaning. He is in a business which allows him metaphor. The research says he must holler at something called a young stellar object. Some days the blackness writes itself. Naturally, a young stellar object hangs out in a stellar nursery in its earliest stages of evolution. Stay with me. The YSOs, because we stay signifying like this, are divided into massive intermediate masses and brown dwarfs. Sometimes the blackness. I'm going back to Brooklyn, to Biggie Smalls, a bridge for sale, to Michael Jordan's birthplace, to No Sleep Till, to the afternoon a 12-year-old dunked on me in a playground in Bedford-Stuyvesant, back when white people asked me if I was scared to live there, and I answered, no, I'm scared of you, you who drag black bodies to rivers, who hang neighborhood interlopers, who 15 years later moves into the center of the starburst I made my goddamn self and calls it Stuyvesant Heights for Fuck you, I'm the stellar one, been under pressure and making explosion after explosion out of the clouds and into the universe. I'm the star builder, La Hawketa, Laventil, Brooklyn. This is where the pressure lives, where our bodies learn to streak blue hot, where we move from stardust to trigger finger to supernova again. Wouldn't you like to learn how to be a part of how you get to be whole, to meet God, to be born again?